So I went down to Yankee Stadium for a workout and uh, walked into the locker room and, uh, and they had wooden lockers, no doors on them. And they had these innocuous names over the top of them like Mantle, Maris, Barra, Scour, and Ford. Uh, and so they uh, took me to the back room and walked by, by a table full of baseballs, I mean, stacked with baseballs. And back then, uh, all the major leaguers would sign balls and they'd give them away to kids, not like charging for an autograph today. It was a different, whole different life back in the early 60s. And uh, so I went out, uh, I was getting dressed, and this guy in this sharkskin suit comes up, and he's ramrod straight, 6'2", really good-looking guy, and he sticks his hand out, and he says, hi. He says, I'm Ralph Houck. I uh, manage the team. Like, I didn't know who he was. And uh, so he said, as soon as you get dressed, go on out on the field, and Frank Grissetti will work you out. And Frank Grissetti was a Hall of Fame name back in the 40s and 50s and was coaching. So I went out there and uh, so they said, all right, grab a bat, uh, take, no, they put me out in the field first. So I ran out to second base and Grissetti would hit me ground balls and he'd hit one right at me and then he'd hit one one foot to my left and then one foot to my right two feet, two feet. Now, I'm not talking about two feet, six inches. I'm talking about precisely two feet. Three feet, four feet, five, six, eight, ten, twelve. See what my range was. So when he got to uh, where I thought was the limit of my range, if the next ball was a foot further out, I wasn't going to get it. So he'd been going left, right, left, right, left, right. And uh, so he threw the ball up, and, and if you're hitting fungos, when you throw the ball up in the air, you got to look at the ball in order to hit it, particularly with that kind of control. So he threw the ball up, and I broke to the right. He hit the ball to the left. So he says, all right, come on in. And uh, he says, uh, grab a bat. And I said, okay. So I went down to the dugout, and uh, there's a bat rack there, and I'm feeling all the bats and I pull this one out and I hear this low growl in the background that says, put it back rookie, that's my bat. And I looked at it and it had Elston, I forget what Elston's number was now, it had Elston Howard's number on it. And I turn around and here's Yogi Berra and Elston Howard sitting there at the dugout. And you probably don't remember any of these names unless you're a real baseball fan, but these were back in the 50s and 60s, these were the gods. And uh, so I said, geez, I know better than that. Put the bat back, grab another bat, and run up to the batting cage. Roger Maris was chasing 60 home runs. So I'm, uh, I'm out there and uh, I go up to the batting cage and I was hitting between Roger Maris and Joe Pepitone. So Maris gets in first. Now all three of us are left-handed hitters. And Maris strokes oh, eight, 10, 15 balls on the line into the right field seats, like a golf swing, just whack, whack, whack. Everyone right around the same place. And I said, all right, Peterman, you jump in there. So I get in there, and of course, you're all adrenaline. You know, you're working out in Yankee Stadium with the New York Yankees. I mean, the, the infield grass was just emerald green, and and they had red brick dust on the dirt part of the infield and there was no one there before the game and so everything echoed and you'd look up and you couldn't see the top of the seats and you could just imagine when they were full of people and you know it had that eerie feeling that you were in the house that Ruth built. So I get in there at home plate and uh, Pitcher throws pitch, and I swear he had it on a string because it just sat there. It took forever. And I swung and I missed. And I said, geez, just hit the ball. That's what you're here for. So he throws another pitch, and I just, I hit it pretty good. 
and uh, uh, high and not too high, but right field. And I said, ah, that could be in the upper deck. Uh, well, be in lower deck. Well, some guy shags it in front of the warning track. So I said, just remember what got you here. Hit the ball over the infield. You're not a home run hitter. So I hit the ball over the infield, and I, good. So I had a good workout. And, uh, so after the workout, went back in, spent some time with uh, Roger Maris, telling me, don't let him send you here. There's no girls there. And go to this town, and don't go to this league. Don't let him send you there. Go to this league. And uh, uh, that was pretty nice. And some of the other guys came over and sat down. Those guys didn't have to do that. It was, uh, there was no, these guys were all just regular great ball players. And uh, so I get dressed and uh, go up and uh, Johnny Johnson was the head of the minor league system at that time. So I go in and I sit down with him and he said, well, Peterman, he said, you had a good workout. We like you. Uh, what do you want? And this was before the age of agents and, and all that stuff. And you're a kid, 21 years old. And I had had all these talks with scouts all during the, the season before I got there about how great I was. And uh, so I looked at them. And I'd always, I grew up in the New York area. And I was always a Dodger fan, a Yankee hater. Well, I, well, I can change. And so I said, uh, well, Mr. Johnson, I said, uh, I've been offered uh, 10,000. I think that's a pretty good number. So uh, he looked at me and he said, mm, I think you ought to take that offer. We don't think you're that good. So then I had to say, okay, do you follow through with the bluff or don't you? I said, well, okay, thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate your time and all that. And I got up and I left. And I didn't have any other offers. And uh, so I signed with Pittsburgh uh, about a week later for less than 10,000. So that's, that's the baseball story. So after baseball, uh, I went through baseball, and I, in my first year, I made the all-star team, and they were, uh, Pittsburgh was quite happy with me, so they uh, put me in the Marine Corps Reserves so that I wouldn't get drafted. So I was in the Marine Corps Reserves, and then I went to spring training, and um, uh, got down to spring training, and... Uh, was uh, had a triple a contract and so i was uh, working out with the triple a team and uh, i was on first base and uh, the guy hit the ball to to short and so i'm running down and they're obviously going to go for a double play and my only objective in mind was to put the second baseman somewhere in left field and so i slid in and uh, he was a real stocky guy I don't know who he was but um, so I slid in and he was making this pivot and our legs crossed like that and I heard this big crack and I looked down and my foot was up here at a right angle from well, my leg I had broken my leg off right there so I, my first tendency was to reach down and push my foot back in place and run off the field. And I got right about there and I said, no, I don't think you're going to do that. So I, uh, that was it for that season. And then uh, um, well, the next season when I went back, um, things weren't quite right. I was very fast, stole a lot of bases and everything. And that probably just wasn't enough time. Uh, to get back and strange thing is you lose focus on some things and when you're playing a sport that's where all your focus is there's no time for anything else and if you take that season off it's hard to get back to that so I went to uh, New York Penn League in Batavia New York and uh, 
I got hurt again, and uh, I got hurt again, and finally got released. And so that was my abbreviated baseball career. Well, then you come back and you got to get a job. I had a wife and a child, and uh, I got married when I was 22. By the time I was 25, I had three kids. And uh, went into General Foods and said I'd like to apply for a management training position. I said, well, we don't have that, but go down the hall and see this guy. And I became a general food salesman. And my first, I went to Washington, D.C., was there about three months, and uh, then got transferred up to Baltimore, same district. Was there about two years, and then I got promoted to uh, Chicago, and was there about two years, and then I got promoted to Atlanta, and was there about... Uh, two years, and then they were going to promote me back up to White Plains and take away my car and my expense account and give me a $1,000 raise, which would have put me at about 15000 a year. And I said, geez, I grew up there. It's going to cost me more than that to live up there. So I quit and uh, went into an entrepreneurial business that, uh, that failed. And uh, so I had to get another job, and then I got a job with Castle and Cook Foods. Strangely, there were a couple of guys who I'd worked with at General Foods who were now with Castle and Cook Foods selling Dole Pineapple. So I got a job as a Southern Region Manager in Atlanta, best job I've ever had. I'd travel all over the Southeast uh, uh, selling Dole Pineapple. You know, I'd go, my territory was from Charlotte or Roanoke down to Miami and over to uh, Alabama, Birmingham, Montgomery. You know, I became a very good tennis player and, uh, and uh, it, was a, it was a good, good time of life. Uh, the largest account in the area and perhaps in the country was a place called Public Supermarkets. And for some reason, the guy who, Charlie Jenkins, who started Publix, uh, took a liking to me. And so uh, of uh, uh, no, uh, no great uh, talent on my part, I, I became quite a hero because I bought a lot of dull pineapple. Went along with Castle and Cook Foods and... Uh, uh, and then there was this little outfit uh, that uh, came down and uh, it was called Job's Houseplant Spikes and they recruited me to come to Lexington, Kentucky to sell these little things. And the business was about $700,000 a year when I got there. And then it was one of these exploding things. Great, great idea, great margin around 15 or 18 million when I got fired. Uh, so I got fired for not following proper procedures or rules. And uh, probably at that time I began to realize that uh, from making up the story in baseball uh, to uh, uh, getting fired for not following the rules that I wasn't a good rule follower. And that's why I didn't like Castle and Cook too many. Well, really, General Foods had more rules, and Castle and Cook had some rules too. And I uh, was a rule breaker rather than a rule follower. So uh, when I got fired, uh, I uh, did what you do when you don't have a job. I became a consultant. And I bought a little cheese company down there, Hall's Beach Beer Cheese, which was a restaurant on the Kentucky River. And Steve Hall and I had been in the Marine Corps, not together, but he had been a Marine and I had been a Marine. And uh, so we started a little Hall's Beer Cheese company because I knew about the food business and the specialty food business through my prior experience. And uh, I thought I could, uh, hell, I can take this and put it all over the country. I know how to do that. And it turned out that uh, beer cheese has a very limited, specific taste area. And that outside of Kentucky and the immediate surroundings, um, 
It wasn't the taste that everybody liked. I had that business, I was making cheese downstairs, and I had bought a duster in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, I was uh, consulting as well as the cheese business at that time, and so I was in Denver, and uh, I looked up at the flight board, and there's a plane going to Jackson Hole. And I said, why not? I've never been there. So I got on the plane and flew to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Great place. Glad I went. Went in this little western store and bought this ankle length coat. And it was a cowboy duster. And uh, so I wore it out of there and I felt a little self-conscious. And uh, uh, I said, no, that's why you bought it. Uh, believe that uh, I like cowboys. I like them because they don't say much, and when they do say something, they mean it. Their word is their bond, and they're independent as hell. And I said, that's the way I want to be, and that's the way I am. And so I wore it out and uh, got on the plane and went to New York to visit a guy uh, who I'd been doing some, uh, he was in the advertising business and we had a couple of mutual clients and I went to New York and I knocked on his apartment door. He worked out of his apartment in New York and he opened up the door and I'm standing there in my cowboy hat and duster. And he says, you know what, Peterman? He says, I like you better because you're wearing that. And I said, you know what, Donald? I said, lots of people like me better. And I don't even know. You get a lot of good approving looks walking through the airport in this duster. Not like you have orange hair and everybody's staring at you, but you know, I kind of like that guy. So I said, uh, okay. I said, well, why don't we try and sell some? So we put a little space ad in the Lexington paper and got one response and that was from my accountant secretary so I had to discount it and I said there must be more people out who want this feeling of independence and, and being your own man so we ran a little ad in the New Yorker and uh, sold 72 dusters on that one little ad and the company was off and running and uh, I was buying dusters from this outfit out in uh, uh, Wyoming, and uh, and I'd buy them on 30-day terms, and I'd get the dusters in, then I'd run the ads in the New Yorker, and they were due on the 15th of the month following the month that the ads ran. So basically, I'd sell dusters, get enough money to pay for the ads the previous month, and then I'd have to buy more dusters to pay for the dusters I brought the previous month. And I just kind of pyramided that or, or uh, stacked one on top of the other all the way through the first year and slowly added another product. I think our second product was uh, Jeffersonian shirt, 99% Jefferson, 1% Peterman. Uh, and then the, another one was a mailbag. Uh, uh, got an old retired mailman, gave me his leather mailbag and we had it reproduced smaller, and that was another product. And uh, so we just kind of went up, never had any money. I borrowed 20000 from the bank. And uh, so going along and used up all that money, and we're running space ads, which is the hardest way to make money. And the uh, banker says to me, John, he said, uh, I know you're paying interest on the 20000 but..." When I loan you money, then I expect you got to pay it back sometime. And he says, you're not paying it back. And I said, but I'm paying the interest. And he says, yeah, but, you know, i got to see some up and down on this thing. And I said, I see. He says, you need to get some capital. Okay, I said, so what's capital? So um, I quickly read some books about venture capitalists and... Uh, uh, put together a business plan for this fledgling company uh, who was just doing stuff that was just nobody had ever done or thought about doing. 
and uh, uh, was getting uh, the printer, was tired of being not paid, so he wasn't going to print the fall catalog, and I didn't have any money, and, and I'd been looking for money, and was had a couple of really bad deals working with some local local venture capitalists. And I got this telephone call, and, uh, and it's this guy named uh, Alex Hambro. And uh, Hambro is a, a very large bank in England, in the UK. And Alex was one of the sons or grandsons of the Hambros. So he was in New York uh, apprenticing under a fellow named Ed Goodman. Who, or who ran the Hambro America venture capital firm. And Ed Goodman is Goodman as in Bergdorf Goodman. So uh, Alex said, well, I thought you might be looking for some money. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, we saw your ads and we thought they're pretty creative and you might have an idea. So Ed came down, the, about a week later and looked around. There was nothing to see. I was making beer cheese in the basement. I had a room full of dusters and, and uh, JP shirts and, uh, and uh, mail bags and a little office with an actual uh, pot stove. And, uh, and uh, that's where it all was, a total of about three or four people. And so Ed and I went out to lunch, and he said, how much do you think the business is worth? And I, she said, I said, I don't know. I said, three or four million. So he picked three, so that was my first lesson. And he put in a million dollars and got 25% of the business. And the J. Peter Wynn Company was off and running. And that's how it started. Well, uh, we, Donald and I, before we ever got the money, uh, said, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, why don't we do a little catalog and mail it out? So we did, our first catalog was black and white, and, uh, and we had color swatches pasted in by this little old lady who lived in Lexington. And uh, we uh, rented 10 lists and mailed them. Uh, and the list broker wouldn't even come. These were other catalog companies. And normally when you prospect like that, your return is quite low. Well, 10 out of the 11 lists worked. I mean, big time. Normally you might get a dollar, a dollar and a half per book, total sales divided by number of books, and we were getting $3.50. And uh, we said, well, let's actually put the book in color. So then we put the catalog in color, and that worked. And then uh, we said, what about putting something for women in the book. So we put something for women in the catalog, and that worked. And then Hollywood found out about us very early on. And I would be, in the beginning, taking orders on the phone as well as doing everything else. And I would be talking to Kelly McGillis or uh, somebody else or somebody else, and. Uh, I'd be sizing them, and I said, "Now, don't be embarrassed, but I got to know your bust size and your waist and and, and your hip size, and and uh, any of those actresses or anything like that. I just, I don't care about that stuff." And uh, I wound up talking to a lot of uh, interesting people in those early years who were calling in, and and it was just a cult that was catching on. And uh, then it began to get bigger and bigger. And, uh, you know, we'd get more people and we'd move and bigger space and uh, more people, more money, go around, raise money, always raising money because 
uh, our sales went from 300,000 the first year to 1.2 million in the second year, to 5 million in the third, to 20 million in the fourth, to 30, 40, 50, 60, 75, and then eventually uh, went out at 75 million, uh, a little over expansion into retail at the time. Travel is uh, an aphrodisiac. Uh, travel is taking yourself out of one world and putting it into another. Um, travel, if you travel well and look and see, uh, is the greatest education that you'll ever come about. Um, today, uh, people will travel to all the tourist places, even Paris, <clears throat> and, you know, they'll go to the Louvre, and, and that's all good, and you got to do that. At first, I didn't do that. I stayed away from any, um, any uh, thing that was touristy. Um, I was in Paris or or London or Vienna or Delhi or Libya for one purpose to find things and to get underneath the culture and to deal with the real people uh, who were making things and making a living and and wound up making great friends and understanding a lot of different cultures and finding wonderful stuff that wasn't readily available uh, around the world. And uh, so, and I, I still do that somewhat. Um, even the web hasn't ruined that as much as I thought it might um, because with travel, um, you get to meet real people uh, and real people who you're potentially or actually going to do business with. Therefore, you get to know them on a different level uh, than uh, the clerk at the hotel or, or whatever that is. Although I have made some good friends with people who have owned small hotels around Europe and, and Asia. Uh, so uh, we, all, we all think that we're experienced, uh, but we really, uh, and we're getting it all from television, which is the worst media available, and we're getting it off the internet. And, and when I, I, today when I'm traveling, I see these people walking around I was in Argentina and we were in this square because there were some arts and crafts uh, going on around it. And we're in this park and I see all these people walking around like this. And I said, what the hell are you here for? There's nothing in that box that you're holding that's going to give you the experience of just keeping your eyes open and ears open and looking at what's happening in this um, in, in, in this country, in this city of Buenos Aires, and you're not going to learn anything off of there. And as far as being told where to go, you know, Google Maps or whatever, you know, use a regular map. I'll tell you why you use a regular map, because you're probably not too good at it, and you're going to get lost, and you're going to learn something. You're going to find some place, and you're going to have to talk to somebody to find out where the hell you are so you can get back. And so even some of the, and it's mostly younger people, um, uh, running around with uh, uh, their cell phone as the thing is stupid in my mind. Uh, yes, I do have a cell phone, and, uh, um, and I use it for uh, answer emails and, uh, and to talk on, and that's about all I use for it. Um, and there's a lot more things that I could use it for, but I don't want to use it for. I don't know why, I don't know exactly how to get to where I'm going. 
I'd rather figure it out. When you go on a shopping trip, you always have an idea. I'm looking for men's or women's dresses or sports jackets or, you know, I want something really different. Well, on, on many trips, you never find what you're looking for. You find something else. And having the eye to recognize that something else is where the talent is. But I'm not smart enough, and maybe some people are, but I'm not smart enough to sit in my office and think out what I don't know. And that's exactly if you're sitting in your office, say, I want this kind of a sports jacket. Well, you don't know what's out in the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's like a, a kid who programs his life. Uh, I'm going to go to high school, I'm going to go to college, and then I'm going to go to grad school, and then I'm going to do this. Now, pretty dull life to me. No opportunity for anything else. I guess if you're going to be a doctor or a dentist, that's what you do. Or maybe it's a lawyer. But hell, I didn't know what I wanted to do until I was 40. And here are 21-year-old kids knowing what they want to do for the rest of their life. My life has just kept changing and changing. One thing works, one thing doesn't work. Then you got to move on. And then you build a resiliency to... Failure. Failure is the greatest learning tool that there is. If you never fail, you've never tried to do anything. And people are terribly afraid of failing. Therefore, they don't try and do something new or out of the ordinary. I probably failed more than anybody. And I'll probably fail again. And the whole idea is it's just part of the learning experience. And then the whatever you want to call it, the guts to get up and do it again. I had a friend who was a World War II fighter ace. And you know, we talked a lot and uh, spent a lot of time together. We actually flew against each other in a mock uh, uh, fighter uh, pilot thing. And, uh, of course, being a World War II ace and me being a uh, novice pilot, um, he uh, uh, pounded me resoundingly, shot me down. Uh, but he says, there's only one thing, and here was a great learning lesson when we were doing this. It's, it's, we sold it in the catalog, and they had these very acrobatic airplanes called Marchetti 260s, and it was in Kissimmee, Florida, and it's called Fighter Pilots. And you go down and they give you a little briefing. Then you get in this plane with an F-16 fighter uh, pilot. And they're side by side. They're used as trainers in many third world countries and actually used as fighters in third world countries. So it's very fast, very maneuverable, and reacts like an F, like a jet. So uh, you get in, you take off, and you fly out about three or four miles and then turn around on the radio, and they, could, they say, all right, fight's on. And so you're, you're closing. They fly about, I think, 360 miles an hour, knots an hour, 400 miles an hour. So you're closing at 800 miles an hour like this. And when the planes get right here, they say fight's on. The idea is to get behind the other guy and get behind him and then shoot him down. And there's a lot more to it, and, uh, and fighter pilots, and read tons of books on it. Uh, but the experience is phenomenal because you actually uh, pull a lot of G's in these little airplanes trying to get around it. So Bert told me, he said, in, in a dogfight, the only thing to remember is to live for five more seconds. Five more seconds. Not 10, not 20, but five more seconds. Because you can live for five more seconds. You're turning around, you're looking for the guy behind you, up above, you're sick because you're upside down, you're pulling G's and you're way down in your seat like this. And he said, live for five more seconds. And then live for five more seconds. Don't let the guy get on you. Keep bobbing and weaving. 
And if you live for five seconds, you can live for five more, and then five more, and then five more. If you don't, then uh, you're dead. And so the greatest lesson, I think, of my life was in a dogfight. And, uh, and yes, it was a game. And we were very maneuverable. And uh, we were upside down. And, oh, the first time you, you run three of these uh, sessions. So uh, I shot Bert down the first time, and then he shot me down the second two. I swear it was rigged on the first one. Um, and on the, on the second one, when he shot me down, uh, your co-pilot there, your fighter pilot, would release some smoke out of the bottom of the plane uh, that would show you, okay, you got him. Look, this fight's over, we'll start another one. Well, the smoke made me deathly sick because it would filter up there. I don't do that again. So on the, uh, on the second and third fight, I was sick. I was thrown up in the cockpit. You're flying upside down. And I would turn right side up and uh, you know, you're pulling it out. And on the third fight, I remember uh, vividly that I saw Bert go down low and off to my left. And the reason you dive low and the other guy's up here is that you gain speed coming down so you can come up much quicker and get on his tail. And I saw him go down and I said, hell, this is just a game and you're throwing up. And he got behind me and shot me down. I didn't live for five more seconds. And had I not had that experience, I really wouldn't understand what it was about. But that's the greatest learning thing in being an entrepreneur that I, advice I could give anyone. Just live for five more seconds.